honour to introduce Professor David Mungo, who is the Laboratory Head in Hearing Research in our Neuroscience Division. David grew up in California and was awarded his Bachelor in Psychology from Yale University and his PhD in Biological Sciences from the University of California. He spent nine years at faculty of Harvard Medical School and 23 years at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. We're very honoured that David came to Australia to join Garvin and establish his hearing research laboratory. David is passionate about hearing research and says, the brain is a beautiful and mysterious subject for study. Every day involves a problem to be solved or something to discover. He's especially interested in how deafness and hearing loss alter the brain organisation and in exploring strategies for hearing restoration. Please welcome David. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, what I would like to do today is uh, talk a little bit about hearing and hearing loss, because looking at the audience, we're all about the same age, and we're going to be having hearing loss. And so it makes sense to understand sound, because sound is, is what hearing's all about. And for me, the miracle is how vibrations in the air become perceived as speech or music, or sirens, or a doorbell. So how is it that these physical entities in our world create the miracle of sound? And so the reason it's so important is because there's something like 20% of the world's population are at risk of hearing loss. And I, I think the stats are in Australia, 50% of people over 50 have significant hearing loss. And 70% of people over 70 have significant hearing loss. And with our age, their life expectancy uh, extending into the 80s, it means the final decade of our lives in Australia will be spent with a communication impairment. And so that means, in, in a rough way, we'll be lonely because we won't be able to communicate with our partners or our grandchildren or our children or our friends or our neighbors. And so it's very important that we protect our hearing. And that means mm -hmm. don't listen to things too loudly, but for most of us, that's, that's, that's history. Mm -hmm. Now we have to figure out how to stay in touch with our social community. And so men especially are in denial of hearing loss. I think the average age between uh, recognition of hearing loss and doing something about it is 10 years. During those 10 years, the brain is undergoing change. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And it's these changes that create the symptoms of hearing loss. If it was just hearing loss, louder would be better and you'd be accurate. But most, what happens is the brain changes so that these other things come on, which impair our ability to understand speech and noise. We don't enjoy eating at restaurants or family dinners, or any kind of party becomes difficult. We have what's known as phantom sounds, sounds that aren't really there, we can hear, it's called tinnitus. And there are distortions of loudness, called hyperacusis. So that we might be in the kitchen and we hear the clatter of dishes, and that can be really annoying or painful. Okay, so these are all things that aren't created by the ear, but are created by the brain. And it's the brain's response to hearing loss. So let's talk a little bit about sound. Okay, so sound is just vibrations in the air. And if we think about tuning forks, okay, when the time goes in one direction, it compresses air, and when it goes in the other direction, it rarefies air, it means that the air is less compressed. And so pairs of compression and rarefaction is a cycle. So the number of cycles per second is called frequency, and frequency dictates how we perceive the sound. So high frequency sounds like a high pitch to us, and the low frequency is, is a rumble. Okay. And so we hear um, from 20 cycles per second, which is low, to 20,000 cycles per second, which is relatively high. At least we did when we were 10 years old and before we expose ourselves to power tools and hair dryers and vacuum cleaners and, and motorcycles and whatnot, okay? 
So as a reference, let's look at a piano. The, the colored key is middle C. It has a frequency of 256 cycles per second. The highest note on a piano is 4,186 cycles per second. And the lowest key is 27 cycles per second. So most of what we hear on a piano is pretty low frequency when you think about our whole range is 20,000. Now my voice, you can, you can only hear, if you were 10 years old, up to 20,000 cycles per second, but my voice actually has components that go up to almost 40,000. So there's a lot of, uh, my voice has a lot of frequency composition that I can't hear and you can't hear. But I think we use those cues that we can't hear because all sounds create harmonics. So we know, for instance, that bats hear really high frequencies, but their ears don't hear those high frequencies. The ears hear the uh, harmonics of those high frequencies, and that's how a bat will communicate with each other using the harmonics of these very ultrasonic frequencies. And so all sounds are created by, comp by different frequencies. And you, we know that because the sound of my voice is different from the sound of your voice based on the dynamics of my vocal cords and my mouth and how I project my voice versus yours. And we each have a unique voice. And we know that because all of you know you can recognize voices on the phone only after a couple exposures. Unless, of course, you have hearing loss. If you have hearing loss, you're going to have trouble recognizing voices and you might not even be able to distinguish a male from a female voice. So hearing loss, while you can still communicate to some extent, uh, takes out the richness. You, lose, you can lose gender of the voice. You can lose excitement or depression in the voice. We, we characterize the way we speak with all kinds of emotions. And the, the, tint, the, the way we tint our voice, we lose. So the color, the color into our voices gets lost with hearing loss. And so in the same way that rain fractionates light into the colors of the rainbow, our ear breaks down the frequencies of sound into its component frequencies. So we want to keep in track, keep in mind that frequency is very important. We'll come back to that. Sound also has energy. Okay, so the amount of force or coming out of my voice, or the amount of pressure created by a speaker is, we, we call that volume or loudness, but it, it's measured by a physicist as pressure. Okay, and so if our hearing was any more sensitive, we'd hear the vibrations of air bouncing against our eardrum. Uh, but we, and we can hear really loud sounds. We can make distinctions between really soft sounds loud sounds. Our ears are really sensitive to changes in loudness. It is thought that when we were young, the amount of sensitivity of our ear was a, a movement, the diameter of a hydrogen ion we could hear. Okay, so we're talking about really sensitive ears. We probably don't have that now, okay, but the gold standard would be like a 10-year-old, say, raised in the woods. The third part, component, important part of sound is timing. It has onset, it has offset, it has duration. Okay. And so there's rhythm, as in the Morse code. There's melody. Okay. This is all part of the timing. And there's pronunciation. Okay. <laughs> pronounce different words in English or whether it's Australian or American or English, right? And so when I came to Australia, I was told English, you know, uh, a great language divided by two countries. <laughs> because what we say here and what we say in America, they mean the same, but they're different, all right? So let's think about sound having frequency, it has loudness or, or energy, and it has timing. And the thing that is really kind of interesting to me and fascinating is that at any instant in time, all the vibrations in the air sum our eardrum. All right?
right? So the fan, traffic, my voice. But if we were walking outside and having a conversation, the traffic, the voices, the dog barking, the, the clatter of, coming out of, of clubs and restaurants, we would hear that. All the, all the vibrations in the environment come to our ear. And so our ear, right, comes to our ear, and it goes to our brain. So it's collected by the ear, processed by the brain, and it circuits. And what does it tell us? It tells us location. Where is it? Right? Is it behind us? Is it to the side? And it tells us the significance. That's what the brain gives us. So the brain then creates space, and it tells us, does it sound friendly or a warning? And so how does it do this? It does it because we learn certain sounds are friendly and certain sounds are endangered. Certain sounds are soothing, like music. And so we learn, we use our entire brain all the time to make these kinds of distinctions about sound. And sound is really a whole thing. The fact that you can understand me, I think, is a miracle begin with, but the fact that you can distinguish ah, e, u, and o when I speak, or even if someone else speaks, if we recognize vowel sounds, whether it's spoken by a child, or a mature male, or a mature female, or an elderly person that, has, that might have a little quiver in the voice, we understand those vowels in a categoric sense. It doesn't matter that they're really different. This is a spectrogram, and it, it, it measures the energy of sounds spoken according to frequency, which is in the, on the vertical axis, and over time. And so it's A, O, U spoken and, and recorded. And you, you can either say, wow, those are really different, or they say they don't look so different, but they do sound different. So regardless of whether we think the spectrogram tells us some information, the sounds are quite different. What happens with hearing loss is we start to lose our frequency discrimination abilities. Okay, so that means separating ah from U becomes more difficult. And especially as we age, we lose high frequencies. So all our consonants, ba, pa, da, ka, those are high frequencies. All our vowels, ah, uh, mm, eh, low frequencies. We, we can't understand consonants so well. So we start to lose words, but we're really good at guessing. All right? We don't want to admit we didn't hear that. So we think about the context, all right? If we're talking about the weather, the kind of words that will show up in a discussion of weather will be very different than the, the composition of words talking about rugby or cricket or music. Okay, so we start guessing and we read lips and we look at body posture. And then sometimes we still don't get it. But we won't necessarily say what. All right. Why is that a problem? Because we're not communicating, but we're faking that we are. And that's a problem. So let's look at another example. Here's a spectrogram of a male saying mill. Okay, so what's reddish and orangish and yellowish has a lot of energy. And as you see the greens and the blues and the whites, no energy. So mill being say, said by a male has a lot of energy in the low frequencies below one. All right, we can see that. And we can see the scatter of blue and green. It's quite, it's very distinctive. Now we have a female saying mill. To me, it's remarkably different. There's still red in the low frequency area near the bottom. There's still green and blue in the middle, but there's a lot more green and blue high. And yet, so here we say, well, this spectrogram gives us a huge difference in how, it's, how, we, how it's, we see it. But we hear the same word. All of us will hear mill in our own particular way and understand it. We think about mill, okay, something that's grinding up grain or something. So this is all the action of the brain. The brain is doing all of this. And so to me, again, 
That's the miracle. The miracle is you could sit in the in, in the opera house, listen to a symphonic performance, listen for the flute, listen for the strings, listen for the horns, and then go back again to hear the flute, switch to the oboe, right? And you can do that at will. It gets harder as we age because we lose our hearing and we can't make those distinctions. So as we lose those, the frequency distinction, it gets harder and harder to shift our attention around. In the same way, we lose the ability to follow speech in noisy environments. Okay. So the whole point of all this is <clears throat> they're, they're all linked. Our ability to ne negotiate our acoustic environment is based on how good our ears are and how we protect them. And if we've lost some hearing, how we can restore it. Okay. Because it, it's important to be able to have these conversations, to listen to music, because that's that's our enjoyment, right? It makes us human. So what happens in noise? So this is a voice that's spoken in quiet. Shoe cat, and you can see the shoe part versus cat. And you can see that you can distinguish shoe from cat, and it's quite distinctive. But if we put it in noise, the shoe cat really goes away. So this means the brain has to work extra hard to, to pull that out. So when you have a voice of interest occurring with other voices of non-interest, it's very hard to extract them. We use other cues, but as we lose our hearing, those cues are not as available to us. You, you don't want to get in that situation, and so for us, it's probably too late to try to protect our hearing, although when I walk down the street and I hear a noisy motorcycle or a siren coming, I cover up. I walk by a jackhammer. I, I think I'm the only one on the sidewalk in Sydney that walks around the street like this. It's important that you protect your hearing. Really. There, there are, if you're out in front of Sydney Uni and Broadway and Parramatta Road, your noise level is like 100 decibels. You're safe for 10 minutes. The, the problem is this, we, we, we all remember those old bake-like dial-up phones that were black, right? They only were good to 3,000 cycles per second, so they, didn't, they wouldn't even cover the frequency range of a piano. So they're, they're really cruddy speakers in those phones. But now think about how we use them. They're in the back of the house or in a quiet hallway. There's only one phone. They're never, the phone was never outside on the street while you're crossing it, or in a car, right? So you had a very quiet place where you're listening to that crummy old black telephone, but you've got pretty good reception. Now, and you could even recognize voices, okay, with those old crummy phones. Now, if they had good speakers, it would have been much better. Because we were able to do so well with those really crummy phones, the governments around the world decided that's all we needed to have good hearing. Okay. So, in a way, we have not yet educated our politicians about the damage of noise, what good hearing really means, and that we want to save our hearing out to 20,000 cycles per second, not just to 3,000 cycles per second. So there are, there, are, there are hearing groups around Sydney and around Australia and around the world trying to educate the public about hearing protection. So the group that I work with is called Better Hearing Australia. And so <clears throat> there's a one day a year, we all go and lobby, try to educate our representatives, but it's sometimes like talking to the wall. Let's, so I want to do a little bit about the biology. So here's the ear, we all recognize the ear. Okay, so there's the pinna, it's here for more than just putting the pencil on or hang, hanging earrings. Uh, it actually collects sound in the, in the environment and funnels it to our eardrum. And we see our eardrum, and we see these, these middle ear bones, okay? And they magnify the vibrations and bring it to the inside the internal ear. So if we peel off the bone of this part of the ear, this is called the cochlea, and look down on it, we're looking down on the, the sensory epithelium part that vibrates to sound, it converts the, the mechanical vibrations into neural signals. So we're 
So we can see in that box, it's a square box, the tips of the sensory receptors, and there are four rows. So these are the sensory receptors that respond to vibrations in air, converted to sound, and can actually convert it to neural uh, impulses that go into the brain. And we have outer hair cells and we have inner hair cells. So if we have normal sensory activity, it looks something like this, very organized, beautifully organized. But if we have damage, it looks like this. So this is uh, from a ear that has suffered trauma. Okay, now you can get trauma from cancer drugs, antibiotics, head trauma, loud noise. But what happens with this is like under normal circumstances, you have a lot, of, you have your full complement of hair cells, sensory cells, you have a full complement of auditory nerve fibers, which are basically neural cables bringing the information to the brain. And that provides you with what I would call a high resolution acoustic environment, much like a high definition video view from your very expensive television. And we all know what it's like when our, our modem goes out and we start getting a pixelated image, right? We don't like pixelated images because we lose resolution. <clears throat> with, with a more pixelated acoustic environment, you're losing the details. You're losing enthusiasm. You're losing excitement. You're losing depression. You're losing sadness. You're losing the colors, the, the way we tint our voice when we communicate to friends. And so <clears throat> this loss of resolution uh, is what really creates the problems in how we communicate. <clears throat> and so the idea then is how does the brain change? And the way the brain changes is what creates the symptoms that we're trying to, so, so hard to try to avoid. And those are, we want to avoid not being able to understand speech. We, want, we don't want to have tinnitus, and we don't want to suffer from hyperacusis. So if we are to create devices and to combat hearing loss, because by, by this time, and at our age, we have hearing loss, but we don't want to lose what advantages we have with good hearing by not attending to this hearing loss. So what we want to do, what we do in our lab, is try to look at the way the brain changes so that we can then advise hearing device makers to create a better, basically, create a better mousetrap. And, and the, real, the real fear, I think, for all of us is as we lose, and we will lose hearing some more rapidly than others, we lose our ability to communicate, and it makes us depressed. <clears throat> okay. As social isolation and depression raises the uh, risk for dementia by fivefold. So if you're starting to feel isolated, or you know someone who's feeling isolated, you need to speak to them, talk to them about getting hearing aids, or seeing their physician about getting plugged back into society.